We are back in the Messy Loft studio for another edition of Indicator Plants of BC. This time, group six, we have some compound leaves. Now, this may be review for some of you, but for those of that haven't done much botany before, we'll just cover what is a compound leaf really quickly. So, like really briefly, in the most basic terms, a leaf is defined as like this thing that does the photosynthesizing and it stems out from a point here where you've got this bud at the the axillary bud at its attachment point to the stem basically so that's what defines a leaf now you can have a compound leaf where you've got this stem and you've got the little bud there and then it comes out and you've got these little things called leaflets and these don't have the buds right here. So this is considered a compound leaf. This is a simple leaf because then it's defined by those buds. Now you can also have leaves arranged in a variety of different ways. You can have them alternate where they come off from, you know, you have them coming off one at a time from a stem. You can have opposite leaves where you've got two leaves coming off in opposite directions. It's like two leaves coming from a single point. And then you can also have world leaves where you have multiple leaves extending out from a single point on a stem. We've seen a couple of those already. But yeah, so you can also have alternate, opposite, or world leaflets as well. That is a basic primer. Let's continue. What are we dealing with this week, folks? We have a few boozy berries, ooh la la. We have a rose bush. We have, yes, more rubuses. Love our rubuses. And then we have some flowery herbs to finish it off. What a pleasant week. Every week's a pleasant week, but I like this week. First of all, our boozy berries. Now, what do I mean by boozy berries? So these are plants. They produce these really nice looking little berries, but these are berries that you don't want to eat. They need to be prepared in some way. You can often cook them. And another way to use a lot of these berries is actually to ferment them, and people have done that to make various wines and liqueurs and all kinds of fancy things. First of all, we have our red elderberry, Sambucus racemosa. Now, it's kind of fitting this is a boozy berry. How I love to remember this uh, scientific name is you've got Sambuca, which is one type of liqueur, You've got mimosas, which is another drink, and then can you imagine if you had a Sambuca mimosa? Oh my goodness, that would sound like it would be really terrible. But these things like to grow in kind of damp, forested sites, rich soils, and a little bit of ethnobotany. Um, these were actually, you can actually create uh, tinctures out of these, which are supposed to be cures for diarrhea. So, you remember that old plant, the cascara, the thing that causes your diarrhea? Well, this actually grows in a lot of the same sites as cascara, so you get a little bit too crazy with the cascara. You're leaking out from all over the place. You can make a little tincture out of this to kind of counteract that. That's a relief. So taking a look at these leaves here. So for so this is a yeah, this is the compound leaf. You can see there's no there's no buds the little axles, the little join parts of these leaflets here. The leaflets themselves, this is a shape that we call lanceolate, and that's a fancy way of saying it looks like the tip of a spear. It's really elongated and pointy. And notice that they're also serrated around the margins there. They're serrated around the leaf edge. And they're this pinnate shape, so they're vaguely, you know, it's the veins are coming off vaguely like a feather. Look at that, all of our terminology is coming into play here. So oftentimes you'll have, you know, you'll have um, arrangements of like six or eight oppositely arranged leaflets, and then you've got the terminal leaflet, the one that finishes off in the end right there as well. A few of the reproductive structures for this plant. So these, uh, so it produces these little white flowers. Here's a, here's a hot hint. A raceme is a type of cluster of flower. So whenever you see, we've had a couple racemosas in the course, whenever you see racemosa, that indicates, hey, this is a plant that produces a raceme. That's what that means. So that's kind of a cool 
scientific name helpful thing going on there. So these little, it produces these little white flowers and then those will grow into these little red berries. Like I mentioned before, not so good for eating, but you can cook them and, and do various things like that. And then you can also, some folks make wine out of them as well. Elderberry wine, totally a thing. Probably hangover central, but you know, give it a shot. Who can say? And another way that personally I love, this is a way that I really like to identify this plant as well. So look at this. So this is early in the season when the leaves have fallen off and then the leaves are regrowing and you can see the some leaves are just emerging from this bud right here. But you look at the stem of the plant. So it's really woody looking. It's this really woody looking shrub. And then it's got all of it's got all of these little glands on the surface there. So I really like that as a way to identify it if I'm ever really confused about it. I look for this woody stem, I look for the glands. Notice how it's kind of arcing out as well. That's a good way to try and identify this plant from a distance. Is you'll so often see it and it's kind of bending over like this big arcing rainbow type thing. A very big, tall, bendy plant. Your red elderberry. All right, our next boozy berry is Sitka Mountain Ash. Sorbus sicensis. <clears throat> so um, Sorbus, the mountain ashes. Um, yeah, another name for another name for this genus for the mountain ashes is actually you might have heard this before. These are called rowan trees. And you'll you'll have some varieties that are especially back in like Europe that are bigger. And this is more of a little shrub, but you'll have bigger mountain ashes that are more like trees. And you'll see rowan trees mentioned if you're reading like lots of crazy old medieval literature and stuff like that, because this was a really significant tree in like Celtic mythology and paganism and folklore and things. And it was thought to be really magical and you could like the fairies would hang out beneath the rowans and all kinds of crazy things like that. So yeah, really interesting tree in that regard. Sicensis. This is a part of a scientific name that pops up all over the place, and what that means is from Sitka. And Sitka is a place in Alaska. Why do we have so many Sitchensises, so many Sitka plants? We've got Sitka this and Sitka that. It's because really early exploration in the Pacific North America was done by the, a lot, the Russians in a lot of the cases. And the way they would come over is they would island hop from Russia across the Aleutian Islands over to Alaska. And Sitka was a really prominent location in Alaska. I think that's one, one of the first locations where they kind of made contact with the Tlingit First Nation. And so that's why you have got the Sitkas all over the place. But why, why is this a boozy berry? Well, one of the things, so first of all, you can make liqueurs out of the berries if you ferment them. You can make wines and things like that. But also, I had a, when I was growing up in Vancouver, I had this mountain ash tree in our backyard, and the berries would ripen up and fall off kind of in early autumn every single year. And the birds would go and they'd eat these, ferment, these berries as they were fermenting on the ground, and the birds would get plastered and they'd fly all over the place and crash into our windows, and it was just mayhem. So a lot of, a lot of memories of the Sitka mountain ash there. Okay, so close look at the leaves. Now it's hard to tell from the photo, but you know, the leaves, they look superficially similar to those red elder elderberry ones we saw earlier. These are, th those red elderberry leaves though, you know, those are about the size of your hand or longer. These are really teeny tiny little leaflets that we're looking at here. Each one of these leaflets is maybe the size of the end of your thumb. So really small little leaflets. And there's a few different uh, sorbuses out there, a few different mountain ashes, and a lot of them look really similar. So one way that we can tell uh, Sitka mountain ash apart from the others is that it's it will be mostly serrated on the outside half of the leaflet there. So look at kind of divide this leaflet in half and look at the bottom half. You know, it's got like a little bit of serration, but not really. And then the upper half, it's more heavily serrated though. Bob's your uncle. Okay, looking at the looking at the reproductive parts, 
we have once again just kind of a clump of little white flowers. There's a lot of clumps of little white flowers in this course, yeah, not too exciting. And then they've also got the really bright orange berries that develop. Yeah, so yeah, this cluster of really orange berries. The the orange berries and these really tiny serrated oppositely arranged leaflets, those are the best ways to tell this plant apart from others. Okay, next up we have a rose bush, bald hip rose, Rosa gymnocarpa. Um, <clears throat> so Rosa, that is the genus that, you know, this is actually in the same genus, this crazy thing here, as the, the plants that on Valentine's Day you are either trying to give to your boo or receive from your boo. So why does this look so different? It's because those commercial roses that we're more familiar with, those sometimes over the course of, you know, decades or even centuries, those have been cultivated and bred and crossbred into oblivion until they're a thing that no longer really resembles a rose. So we talked about this with earlier plants, but roses, you know, they're in the family Rosaceae and a few really strong, Rosaceae have a few really strong distinctive features with their flowers. Each one of the rosaceae flowers has five petals and then lots and lots of little stamens in the middle, like a couple dozen little stamens in the middle there. So look for those really distinctive signs of the flowers and that is a good chance that you're looking at your, a type of some kind of rose. Getting a closer look in on the leaflets. <clears throat> so yeah, it's got, the leaflets, they actually look superficially similar to some of the mountain ash leaflets that we were looking at now. You know, these little, they're these small little leaflets, they're oppositely arranged. These are a similar size. They're about the size of, you know, your thumb, maybe a slightly bigger, like the end of your thumb, maybe slightly bigger than that. And, but notice these ones, they're serrated all the way around. And they're quite a bit fatter than those in mountain ash as well. <clears throat> Here is the flower. So as I mentioned, it's got the five petals going around the outside there. Lots and lots of little stamens in the middle. Those are some of the calling cards of the, of the rosaceae, of the roses. And, <clears throat> and yeah, they're really beautiful pink flowers. Um, how big are these flowers? Uh, these flowers are about, the, it's about the same area as like, the lid of a jar of jam or a peanut butter jar. If you can imagine about that size. So yeah, not crazy big, but not super small either. And so if we're, so the Rosa gymnocarpa, your bald hip rose, it's a pretty distinctive looking plant when you find it on its own, but it can often be confused with other similar looking things in the same genus, and Rosa, especially your Nootka Rose. So how do we tell it apart? Well, the trick there is to look at some of, is to look at the fruits. Now they produce this fruit, this rose hip here. And in most, uh, most other roses, you'll have the sepals, which is these kind of little funny little leafy parts of the flower below the petals. The sepals will stay on and just kind of die and hang out there. And so they look like this. You've got kind of these big trailing bits here. In uh, the bald hip rose, look at it though, the sepals fall off. And so you've got this, it's the, it's the bald rose hip. That's why it's called bald hip rose. And the scientific name, gymnocarpa, that literally translates to naked fruit. And that's what that's referring to. It's referring to the fact that these sepals fall off. And that's a, that's a really great way to identify this versus other things in the same genus. Okay, ooh, yes, next up, more rubuses. These are some of our delicious berries, you know, some of our blackberries, raspberries. We love our rubuses. First up, an icon of the Pacific Northwest, we have our salmonberry, Rubus spectabilis. This is a really, this is, you know, this is a really common plant in the lower mainland in Vancouver. You kind of see this growing around all over the place. It loves, it loves really streamside habitats. It tends to tolerate um, dampness quite well. And 
In summer, you'll see a lot of folks out picking the berries off of this thing. It produces some really tasty berries and it produces them in quite large numbers too. So compared to, you know, a lot of the other rubuses that we look at in this course, they tend to be, they're all shrubs, but some of them are really, really small and they look, you know, they almost look herby. Some of them, you know, some of them like the thimbleberry, they don't really produce these bushes. The salmonberry just grows in these big, massive bushes. And so it's quite a distinctive looking plant in that way. But we want to, to really identify it. You want to look at the fruit. You want to look at the leaves. So here is the leaves that we're going to look at to really nail this puppy down. And this is super fun. Here's the secret. So it's got what's what we call in, the, in botany a, a trifoliate leaf. And that means it's got this compound leaf with three leaflets. One, two, three. Kind of two lateral leaflets and then this terminal leaflet on the end there. And the cool thing about the lateral leaflets, you fold down this terminal leaflet and you can make a really fun butterfly. So look at that. It's got these big, huge lobes on the bottom there and then these big lobes on the top as well and so it turns into a beautiful butterfly my girlfriend thinks that my girlfriend was we were talking about this and she's like oh yeah that's the one where you make a mustache so i, I don't really think she knows what mustaches look like and you know that may be because i can't really grow a mustache but that is a whole separate issue so look for the beautiful butterfly to identify this plant by its leaves getting into some of those reproductive structures though Check out those pretty little flowers. Rubus, that's a genus that falls under the Rosaceae as well, the rose family. And so same kind of flowers. You see lots of little stamens in the middle, lots and lots of stamens, and then five petals. And the flowers, there's, these, there's this kind of really vibrant pink color, really pretty flowers. And those, once they're pollinated, will grow into berries. And salmon berries are funny because they kind of come in all different colors. And so, you know, they kind of, you can see the least ripe are sort of like this, and they go all around until they're really dark colors. And it's, yeah, it's a funny thing. They get in really, f like a huge variety of colors. They'll start being sweet, you know, when they're about like this. And then sometimes, you know, they're not as great when you get to the end there, though. Or like a huge variety of these berries. Why, now the trick, why are they called salmon berries? Well, Take a look at maybe a typical salmon berry here. Now, to the right of that, this photo, that is a bowl of salmon roe, little salmon eggs. And that's a pretty uncanny resemblance, eh? That is where that name comes from. Next up, our trailing rab raspberry, Rubus pubescens. <clears throat> so this is a really, yeah, this is a really funny little plant. Um, this is one of those rubuses that grows right in right on the ground and it's it tends to form these mats so you'll have one teeny tiny little plant and it'll grow a rhizome which is this underground stem and then you'll have another little plant pop up next to it and so it forms these big mats on the ground that way and these little pokey stems that just kind of pop up out of the earth like funny little moles getting a closer look at this thing so this is a this is yeah so this is another another trifoliate leaf that's a good thing to note for most of the rubuses they are trifoliate they've got those three leaflets there and this one you know it's got some serrations around the outside just small little leaflets the name the pubescens what that refers to in the scientific name is the fact that this thing it doesn't have any little spikes or thorns on it it just has little hairs all over the place so this is one that you're not going to be worried about pricking yourself if you are out berry collecting, which is something that we always enjoy. Into the reproductive structures. So whereas the salmon berry flowers were pink, these ones tend to be more white, but it's the same general shape. And now that will develop into these raspberries here, and we all know what gorgeous raspberries look like. Um, yeah, it's, it's got the, all these clusters of little globe-shaped fruits that, yeah, they're just really delicious, really bright red, really enjoyable little, little berries. Okay, easily confused is our trailing blackberry, Rubus ursinus. So, 
Yeah, this is one, it, it's pretty easy to confuse this one with the, the trailing raspberry, so we'll focus on a few key differences. Kind of most importantly right off the bat is that this plant has lots of little spines on it. So all over the place, it's got these little spikes, and you got to watch out if you're picking this one. It tends to, you know, it grows on these lateral stems, kind of these stolons as well, and this will... And so what this does is these will kind of wrap around your feet and with the spines and they kind of get all tangled up in your socks. And if you find a lot of this on the ground, it's pretty annoying to walk through. But it does tend to form these big white, these big mats, just like the trailing raspberry that we looked at. Now, one more thing, while the trailing raspberry it was growing upright, like the little plants were kind of poking straight up out of the ground on these stems. The trailing blackberry tends to be kind of lying down and falling over all over the place. So that's a good way to kind of look at it from a distance and really easily distinguish what it is. Okay, another good clue to distinguish this thing. This is a little bit more subtle, but they do have slightly different leaflets. So if you look at the trailing raspberry, the Rubus pubescens, it's got these leaflets that all look basically the same. Like the terminal leaflet looks pretty similar to the lateral leaflets. With the with the trailing blackberry, however, the terminal leaflets often have like these three lobes going on. So you can see one big lobe here, another big lobe, and then another big lobe there. This is a little bit more subtle, but you have the same type of thing. One lobe, two lobes, three lobes. So that's a, that's a, that makes this look fairly distinctive compared to the trailing raspberry as well. And finally, so this one will also, you know, will produce blackberries. So the berries are a much darker color. They range from this one. These ones aren't super ripe, though they will get blacker than this. You know, they'll, they'll look much blacker. But yeah, they range in color from kind of this reddish to purplish to blackish color. Um, the flowers look kind of similar though. The flowers, it also produces these little white flowers, five petals, five sepals underneath, and then lots and lots of little stamens in the, poking out in the middle, those classic rosaceae flowers. Okay, moving on to some of our flowery herbs. We are in herb country, folks. First of all, three-leaved foam flower. Tiarella trifoliata, <clears throat> and so this is a this is a one of those cool scientific names because it tells you what to look for. Trifoliata, what does that mean? That means that this is a trifoliate herb. We talked about that classic one, two, three leaflet format that we also saw with the rubuses. So this is a this is a really cool little herb. <clears throat> See it growing, you know, right just on down on the forest floor, just this little tiny plant. And the way that we really want to identify this one is with the flowers. Like the flowers make this look quite distinctive. And I think Sh Shannon mentioned this before when she was in a really kind of poetic mood. And she was saying, it's called a, it's called a foam flower. And imagine you're on the seashore and a wave crashes and hits the rocks and it throws the foam into the air. And that's kind of what the flowers look like. You look and it's just this, you look at this photo on the right here, the flowers are just these little, this little white spray that sprays out of the earth there and forms this kind of foam above the forest floor. Really neat looking little plant. Okay, closer look at some of those leaflets. Now, how can we, so how can we identify this compared to some of the other trifoliate things that we looked at? Especially, you know, like those rubuses. This could probably be confused with the, with the trailing raspberry that we looked at. Well, one thing to look for is the fact that all those rubuses, they're really, really spiky around the edges. They've got really highly serrated leaflets. These ones, look at them, they tend to be much more rounded. So it's got a little points, it's got little points in places, but much rounder and kind of scallopier around the outside there. We talked about this with some of the other plants before. It's like, imagine, you're, you know, it's rounded on the outside like your grandmother's tea doilies. So pointy in a couple little spots, but really much more rounded than the rubuses that we we're looking at. And once again, really key, it's got that trifoliate format. 
Okay, and a closer look at those beautiful little flowers. So yeah, just these little these little uh, these little white flowers that uh, that spray out from on from on top of it there. Okay, finally, Sitka valerian, Valeriana sicensis, another Sitka plant. I told you we'd find lots more of these. So this is a plant that we often see. It grows it grows well in really wet areas, and we often see it actually as kind of an alpine plant. You see this one in alpine meadows in a lot of places, and apparently, you know, it grows so it grows in these cold environments. And apparently, after I haven't experienced this myself, but after the first frost of the year, it's supposed to have kind of this really really strong smell that isn't really that pleasant. So look out. Now, there's other kinds of valerian all over all over the world, and this is another plant that's supposed to have powerful medicinal properties. Um, in North America, Valeriana sicensis, your Sitka valerian, was used by I believe that I believe the Tlingit First Nation used it a little bit like tiger balm. You could put it on sore, you can make an ointment and put it on sore muscles, supposed to soothe those. Apparently pregnant women that were breastfeeding and were like, oh my gosh, I am so sore. You could, you could kind of rub it on your nipples and that would relieve some of the pain there. Apparently other varieties in Europe though were used more like an aphrodisiac. So this is a, so this is a, a genus that can be used for everything from your tiger balm to like your Viagra. What a crazy plant, I love it. Getting a closer look at those leaves now. Some of them have that kind of look trifoliate. They have that basic shape like the three leaf foam flower that we looked at. Um, one important thing to note though, it produces these opposite compound leaves. So this is one compound leaf coming out here, another compound leaf coming out on the other side there. And whenever you find opposite leaves on a plant out in the wild, really pay attention to that because there's like the fraction of plants that have opposite leaves is really, really tiny compared to those that have alternate leaves. So it's a really important thing to pay attention to for your identification. Now, yeah, so it'll have fewer leaflets on these leaves that are kind of higher up on the stem. It'll have more leaflets on kind of these longer compound leaves lower down. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, five leaflets down here, and only three, which is higher up the stem there. <clears throat> and yeah, and so these, um, these compound leaves can also extend out and be relatively long as well. And around the edges, this is another one, it's not very sharp around the edges. It's just kind of these gentle rounded scallop shapes and super elongated uh, leaflets as well there. A few things to pay attention to. And of looking at the looking at the reproductive structures now. So it's got this terminal if inflorescence. It's that big compound flower that occurs right on the tippy top of it. Kind of these pretty little pink flowers and they all cluster together. How can you remember that it's this Sitka plant that has things that cluster together? Well, Sitka is a cold place in Alaska, and things that are cold like to huddle together for warmth. Everyone's seen March of the Penguins. So there you go. So once these are fertilized, then they'll turn into these funny, like, believe it or not, these are the, the fruits right here. And what's going on here is it's this structure that's got all these little wispy bits, and the seeds are attached there. And those will be dispersed by the wind. It's one of those. It's one of those kind of puffball type plants, like your dandelions and your things like that, that loves to be dispersed by the wind. Okay, that is it for this group. Go on Patrick's website, review the re quiz yourself, come to lab for some review, and have a good one, folks.